Making those regions slash empire gowns is fun, but I know my ancestors in Finland never wore fashions like that. How did the women dress around here then? In bigger cities and towns, people were following European fashions, but in the countryside, people were sticking to their traditional clothes. So, let's make a traditional Finnish folk costume. Not so fast. First, I need to decide which traditions I wish to follow. Finland has always been at the border of East and West. For hundreds of years, most of the area known as Finland was part of Sweden. It's no wonder then that many Finnish folk costumes share similarities with Swedish folk costumes. My family, however, is from Northern Karelia. This part of Finland mostly belonged to Russia. While in the West, the people were of Lutheran faith, in the East, the religion was Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Just it happens that my family is split between these two traditions. While I don't subscribe to any religion, my mother's ancestors were Orthodox, while my father's were Lutheran. Besides the faith, the traditional costumes are different between these two populations. I happen to own a Western style Monsala costume already, so I decided that I wanted to delve into Karelian folk dress. Karelian women's folk costume is similar to Russian folk costumes in the western parts of Russia. The first layer is shirt, called Tatsina, that is more like an underdress, as it reaches below the knee. The shirt is made out of linen or cotton, and often the visible parts were made out of finer quality fabric. The neckline is gathered and has a slit that closes with the button. The neckband is often decorated with embroidery. The sleeves are straight or leg and button shaped, and the hem is often decorated with red work embroidery. The second layer is a seraphine dress. There are several types of seraphine, but I chose to make this straight seraphine that was common at the turn of the 19th century. It is basically 3 meters of fabric carefully pleated around the body, only with the back slightly lower than the front. The shoulder straps keep the dress in place, and a belt is tied just under the bust. These kind of dresses became popular at the arrival of printed cottons, and they were often decorated with colorful ribbons. What about the head then? A respectable married woman was supposed to cover her head, while maidens wore silk ribbons or scarves around their head. I make a very simple linen cap feathers up at the back. It is surely more modest than the Soroka hats worn by most of the women. These hats were often colorful and or featured complicated embroidery. However, this simple cap suits my aesthetics more. Another part of respectability was an apron. For a festive occasion it was often made out of silk and decorated with lace or ribbons. The apron was tied on with a belt that was also used to carry a pocket. The whole outfit was finished with a scarf. Silk scarves were very popular although simple cotton ones were worn outside of festive occasions. The first thing for me to sew is the shirt. I am using a pattern by Vuorelma, a Finnish company that specializes in national costumes. I have already cut out all the pieces out of this lightweight linen fabric. The pattern has four parts, a front and a back, sleeves and a triangular underarm gusset, oh and the neckband. I start by hemming the sleeves. I fold the hem twice and baste it in place, then I hem it by hand.
Next, I pin the front and the back together all the way up to the point where the gusset begins. I baste the side seams. Here is the ratsina at this stage, so I baste the side seams because I didn't check the sizing. I thought that I would fix it at this point because it's a really loose fitting garment. So I just pin the gathers, see that yeah, it looks quite alright when I gather it up. Now I can sew the side seams and attach the sleeves. Now I have sewn the long side seams all the way with the gusset. This garment has triangular gussets, so one of the sides of the triangle goes between the front and back pieces, and the last tip of the triangle goes to the sleeve. So I sew this with running back stitches. So I do a back stitch and then a few running stitches. And this way the seam will be a little bit more durable than what it would be if I use just running stitches. And my thread is linen thread. I've never sewn with linen before, but it seems to work quite okay. This is basically bobbin lace thread and I waxed it very well to keep it from breaking because linen thread has this tendency of breaking quite easily if you don't wax it. I've already done the other gusset, so when I'm finished with this gusset, I will then have to fill a lot of seams. I have to fill the seams before attaching the sleeves. I'm really looking forward to doing the embroidery at the hem. One embroidery pattern came with this pattern, but I have this whole book of Karelian embroidery and I'm considering using some of the patterns from there. The problem was that I wasn't able to find the right kind of embroidery thread in Finland, which is ironic since this is Karelian outfit. I actually had to order it from UK, so it will take a few days for my embroidery thread to arrive. I have to use this special embroidery thread that is red but that doesn't shed any color even if I wash this in 90 degrees. Okay, it's done. So now that the felling. I have to determine the right direction into which fell the seams. As you can see I have this three-way seam in here and this is going to be challenge like how to navigate the seam in here. I think this is the back, this is the front, so I want to fill these towards the back. I trim one side of the seam allowances down to about 3 mm and then fold the remaining seam allowance over and under. Then I slip stitch it in place to make a neat felt seam. After felling the side seams, I attach the sleeves. The front slit gets a narrow hem. I also strengthened the bottom of the slit with a row of blanket stitches. My back piece was a little bit too long, so I shortened it a bit. Then I can gather the neckline. I am doing this by hand, which takes time, but I'm trying to keep with the traditional methods.
Before adding the neckband, I wanted to try the shirt on. The fit is otherwise okay, but the sleeves are too wide and too long. I had to both shorten and narrow them down. I also decided that the neckband of the original pattern was too short for my taste. It made a very tight fitting neckline, and I wanted a bigger one. This is not historically incorrect, as many museum shirts have quite large necklines. Now I can attach the neckband. The neckband is sewn to the right side and then folded over to the wrong side. Now I'm finishing the neckband with hemming stitches. Now it is time to hem the bottom. Oh, I wish hemming could be this fast in real time, although I actually enjoy slow sewing. The slit needs a thread loop for the button. First, I make a few loops with my linen sewing thread and then I cover them with buttonhole stitches. Remember when I told you that I was looking forward to embroidering the hem? Well, after doing a little practice embroidery, I decided that I'd much rather spend the time embroidering the neckline, which will be visible in the final costume. I can always add the embroidery to the hem later. I found this pattern from a 1950s book called Karjalan Kirion that I found in, in a flea market. Here is the finished neckline with a mother pearl button attached. I'm really happy how this came out. I finally didn't do the embroidery at the hem. It would have taken a lot of time that I don't have. From making a pocket that you will see later and the embroidery at the neckline, I know how time consuming it is to embroider a whole hem of a shirt. So I understand why in the old days women used to do this hems and store them and, and only sew them on the upper part of the shirt when they were finishing the shirt. Another thing that is not completely historically correct is that my whole shirt is made of this fine white linen. Historically only the visible upper parts of the shirt were made of high quality fabric and the lower parts of the shirt were made of more coarse, less expensive fabric. These kind of shirts, or you could even call these underdresses, could be worn alone at home. During colder times, you could add a petticoat to keep yourself warm. This was only the start of my Karelian dress project. In the next video, you will see how I make this kind of woven belts using a backstrap rigid heddle. Later, you will also see how I made the sarafan dress that goes over the shirt. Thank you for watching this video. And please subscribe to help me grow this channel. See you in the next video. Bye!